like to introduce, on behalf of our wonderful congregation, the Reverend Dr. James Carter, who we've all seen and known and loved before, but we're very honored to have him to complete and round out our series on teaching us how to pray. So if you'll give me a welcome. opportunity to be here today. We thank you for our health. We thank you for our well-being. We thank you for our families. We ask that you bless our time, for we know that wherever two or three are gathered in your name, you are here also, and help us to learn and grow in our faith. And please bless Jim as he presents today, so that we can hear his words and bless them to our understanding. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Kelly, can you ask people, if you're going to say anything, say it loudly. Here it is working. Be loud, folks. You've got Bobby's permission. Be bold. Be bold. When I uh, first heard uh, the name of the series, Soul Food, I thought oh, I'm going to get to fried chicken. Chitlins? Do some chitlins. Yeah. <laughs> Do some cooking. Uh, and then uh, folks said, oh, no, 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 no. This is about prayer. And uh, I had the opportunity to read what David did. And then last week I came and listened to um, Kelly. I thought, oh man, you know, I had to say, let me go last. <laughs> Soul Food Series, teach us to pray. And I'm going to do things a little differently than uh, has been done before. Uh, I'm going to give time for folks to ask questions and to make statements after the fact, but so we don't get taken off into different directions uh, and get lost. Uh, I'd like to stay on a uh, particular subject uh, and then go back to it if we if we have to or have concerns about it. The thing I, that I want to accomplish this morning with the help of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God is to stir you up to pray earnestly in the weeks and months ahead for this congregation. We want to enlarge and purify the body of Christ in this place. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. From Psalms 127. You know, we can work our heads off and, and have countless meetings. And we can go through the motions of worship but if God isn't in it, it will be hollow and merely human with no divine spiritual life or power. And there are a few things more fearful to me than the specter of a church running on the momentum of tradition and habit when the power has been severed. Like a train full of people enjoying the scenery, but coasting to a stop in the desert because the locomotive has been disengaged and has 
disappeared over the horizon. Obviously, that's a metaphor. <laughs> As a church, we need to understand that earnest, heartfelt prayer is the mean by, means by which we can couple ourselves to the locomotive of God's power. Didn't Jesus say, I am the vine, and you are the branches? He who abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. That's in John 15, 5. But hope how easily a church can become deceived that even though it is not praying, its activities are something when in fact Jesus says they are nothing. Oh, how grateful I am that Norfield is not severed from her power. The locomotive is hitched. The sap is flowing. Dozens of people have told me that they are in prayer for this ministry. And all you have to do is listen to our pastor's sermons and you will understand that he's preaching the gospel and being led by the Holy Spirit to ensure that our locomotive remains pitched and the Norfield train is connected. I believe that if we keep praying, we will hold fast to Jesus Christ. Much of what I say this morning is geared to kindle that very thing. We must be spreading a flame of prayer, and not only individual prayer, but group prayer. History proves beyond a doubt that the way God effects revival, spiritual power, joy in worship, the healing of animosities and zeal for outreach is by putting a burden for prayer upon a congregation and then pouring out blessings in response to their pleas. God, give Norfield such a burden. Plato, I've got to do something for the seminarians. Plato, 424, 423 BC, 348, 347 BC, drawing on the words of his teacher Socrates, 469 BC, 399 BC, considered the soul the essence of a person, being that which decides how we behave. He considered this essence to be incorporeal, eternal, to be an incorporeal, internal occupant of our being. As bodies die, the soul is continually reborn in subsequent bodies. The Platonic soul comprises three parts. The logos, or mind, or reason. The thymos, or emotion or spiritedness, the eros, or appetite, or desire. Each of these has a function in a balanced, level, and peaceful soul. Just what is prayer? Ideally, all the Christian life is lived in an attitude of prayer. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Colossians 3, 17. Prayer is to be infused into all and everything we do. Nevertheless, it is helpful to get some basic rudimentary idea of what prayer essentially is. So the following reflections are aimed toward developing a basic definition of prayer. 
in order to discuss prayer, we need to know what we're talking about. I will lean heavily on the biblical practices of prayer as I try to work toward a definition. The Bible often talks about prayer. It also gives us specific examples of prayer that biblical characters pray. Both are important in understanding the nature of prayer and the kinds of prayer and the kinds of prayer that are appropriate to the Christian life and the Christian faith. It is assumed that it is possible to address God. It is assumed that it is desirable to address God. It is assumed that God responds to prayer. In Psalm 65, 2, God is addressed, O you who answer prayer. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 11, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good, give good things to those who ask him? But the issue is more complex than it might first appear. What is prayer? What qualifies as prayer? There are many different types of prayer. A prayer could be a sudden outburst of praise. A prayer could be a cry of immediate need. A prayer could be a hymn of praise to God. Even though God is spoken of in the third person and not directly addressed, as in this case, immortal, invisible God, only wise, and in light, inaccessible, hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the agent of days, Almighty victorious, thy great name, we praise. And prayer can be expressed without words. There is silent prayer, more intent on listening to God than speaking to God. There is prayer through sacrifice in the Old Testament. But dance can also be prayer. A song can be prayer. Some ritual act or motion can be prayer. What about the conversations with God that are rec recorded in the Bible? Wouldn't these also qualify in some sense as prayer? So while it might not seem so at first, really there is quite a bit that is subsumed under the category of prayer. Biblical scholars, therefore, therefore are quite a bit more narrow in their definition of prayer. Without a more precise definition, it is difficult to discuss. They tend to speak of a psalms as the poetic compositions that were used in Israel's worship, and be prayer as prose writings addressed to God, which usually contain some type of request. In some instances, it is difficult to distinguish a prayer in this sense from what might be called a conversation with God. Biblical prayer is not understood as a one-way communication. Prayer of petition, that's asking God for something. An intercession, asking God for some blessing on someone else are prominent throughout the scriptures. And it is at this point that our theology can trip us up. It is at this point that intellectual problems can arise. I feel very strongly that our theology must support our practice. If my theology undermines my ability to ask and pray, it is my theology that needs to be adjusted and readjusted. We are instructed to pray, give us this day our daily bread. This is petitionary prayer. We are continually given examples of people who prayed on behalf of others. This is intercessory prayer. And we are told, ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find. Not 
and the door will be open for you. For everyone who asks, receives, and everyone who searches, finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Matthew 7, 7. Many years ago, intercessory prayer started to become the heart and soul of my prayer life. Prayer became a ministry and an outreach. But let me suggest that human nature being what it is, the most basic and common form of prayer is a plea for help. This is where prayer starts. In difficult situations, we instinctively call out for help. So from the standpoint of human experience, petitionary prayer is bound to be the individual's first experience of prayer. It is from this point we move up the ladder of prayer. We learn to pray for others. We learn to make gratitude, praise, and thanksgiving. We learn to make those a more central part of our prayer life. And then we learn to listen. We learn that prayer can be simply the sense of being in God's presence. But we will never reach the higher realms of prayer without starting somewhere. And generally speaking, that somewhere is very simply, God, help me. Sin, suffering, supplication, salvation. The history of man's prayer relationship with God. If we go back in scriptures, all the way back to Adam and Eve, and follow through all the books of the Bible, we find something very interesting because it's still going on. We find man sinning, and as a result of that sinning, we find and suffering. And as a result of that suffering, we find him supplicating or praying. And after that praying, we find salvation. Nothing has changed. From then to now. And if we look around us, we look at our congregations, we look at our uh, relationship with God, it's the same thing. Sin, suffering, supplication, and then salvation. I believe with all my heart that Northfield is on the way to something really, really special. My wife and I are here because we feel something special. We believe that if this group of people as a congregation come together in group prayer, we can expect Bernard to tear it up every Sunday. And he does that. We can expect there to be groups of people joining the church like last Sunday. But after 45 years in the ministry, after preaching in every denomination that I can think of, after speaking all over the world, what I see is the same thing happening. Us leaning on the preacher, us leaning on the deacons, us leaning on one or two individuals in the congregation. And what I'd like to see happening is something like soul food continue and grow and have people come together in larger groups and pray the different kind of prayers I talked about. I know and I speak from experience 
that everything I had ever prayed for in my life, God has answered three ways. Yes, no, and wait. And I've had to learn how to be patient. I've had to learn how to ask for the right thing. I've had to read my scripture. I've had to have prayer meeting with myself. And I do that every single morning. My wife said something to me the other day. We were sitting and talking and I was in my study. I don't know what I was doing, something silly. And uh, I just decided I wanted to go chit-chat with her. And we started talking about prayer. And she said to me, you know, since I've known you, every morning I get up, I'm in prayer with the Lord. I thank him for allowing me to go to bed last night and to wake up this morning alive, feeling the blood cursing through my veins. She didn't know, but boy, she got to me. I thought about that all day long. And I just want to thank you here at Norfield for what Mary and I are receiving, not just from Bernard and his wife, but from the people who've, who've come to us and who've talked to us about things that they're doing and about the prayers that they're praying and watching what's happening here at Northfield. And you can tell, you know, you can uh, go to a church. I went to a church not too long ago. Bernard showed up. Church must be a couple million dollars. And I bet maybe there were 30 people in the congregation. That said something to me, that people are out this morning uh, with the time change. It says something to me. There's a hunger here at Northfield, and I want to be able to do everything I can to help. Now I'm going to open up and let's throw prayer around. Anybody have any questions or anything to say? Somebody has to say something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yes. Not, I'm not shy. Um, I really want to, well, thank you for being here. And thank you for sharing your ministry and your spirit with not only the congregation, your family, but with me, the presence of self. Um, there is a power. I, I told Bernard and I told, um, I forgot the pastor before him, uh, Carl <laughs> and Anne, that there is a, 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 this church was built on the Holy Spirit. Truly was. If you come here, and I know any of you have come here, and when there's no one here, you are welcomed. If you come naked, you are welcomed. So this church foundation, whoever built this, was a praying church. Uh, they were humble people, and they came with a ministry to build on God's word and his power in the name of Jesus. So the people before us set this foundation, otherwise we wouldn't be here. The people who are here today share that same passion and spirit. It's um, unconditional love. It's forgiveness to each other because we have gone through issues as a church and we have come through even stronger because we have been praying people. We don't have hidden agendas. We serve one master, and we pray, and we hug, and we touch, and we love and forgive. And I think 
that is the name of the family. When I first moved here, I searched for a church family who would love me unconditionally, welcome me openly, and love me and, and help me grow. Understand my failures, forgive me, and help me, but also serve as a church of love and spiritual growth. We are that church. And I'm proud to say I'm one of those members who, I'm not gonna say I do it every day, sit down structurally, but I pray without ceasing. My mom taught me that, my dad taught me that, my grandmother taught me that, that anything that I'm doing is a prayer. So I, just like I come in here, I, I pray. So if you do it consistently, and then you set aside for devotion, your whole life is a prayer of praise with the power of the Holy Spirit. I say that, we said that last week, walking out. But this church speaks on the power of the Holy Spirit. I've gone to churches where it's just been God and Jesus. They forget that power. They forget that power that we need to seize upon every day. The Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit, you know, I had to call my mom two weeks ago after Bernard's message because I got so moved by the power of the Holy Spirit. And she asked me, how did the person next to you feel? I said, I didn't pay any attention to the next person. <laughs> <laughs> because she knows, you know. <laughs> That's not. But the thing is, I want to tell you and thank you, and I don't want to take everybody else's time, but we are church prayers. We are not this bombastic group. We are humble people. And we are not, we are humble servants, but we also are bold, proud prayers. We are proud prayers, and we all capture and see the power of the Holy Spirit. I know that because these people know me and love me, and I love them back. But I know these people, and I know that they see the power of their own power of the Holy Spirit through prayer. You will be up here next week. But this is who I am. One of the things that I think that is, is so good about Northfield is that we are prayers, but we are also doers. And we are able to implement as best we can uh, that which we pray for. And, and not only in our relationship with each other, but with the larger community. And I think that that's something that speaks well for the, the, the strength of the spirit within us, is that is that yes, we pray, but then we take it the next step and we follow up on our prayers and, and with action. And whether it be whatever, it's just it's something that, that we're very committed to. And I think that that solidifies us as a group uh, as much as, as anything. It's, a, it's, it's a well-rounded uh, group of people and a group of activities. The fact that your, the close of your prepared remarks was met by silence, I think, is simply an indicator that you gave us a lot to think about. <laughs> uh, concerning the church, there is a real risk that we will become self-congratulatory. <laughs> I guess you'd classify that as the sin of pride. Um, but looking at the history of this congregation, this were solely a human institution, it would have fallen apart decades ago. Uh, there's something that keeps us going and keeps us working. This is not a Sunday morning church. We have small groups that meet during the month. We have prayer groups that meets every Wednesday. Uh, we have a prayer chain. We have all kinds of spiritual action, spiritual exercise like that. And I think that's a large part of what we should encourage and what keeps us going. Um, 
But take it easy on the self-congratulations. You love the church, but, but uh, don't sprain your arm, pat yourself on the back. <laughs>
See, I, I, I think that there are, <clears throat> I think that there are two things happening in our culture. Uh, church has become a social thing. It's, it's become something that you do socially because a lot of other folks do it. But heaven forbid that it gets in the way of your soccer game. It gets in the way of your football game on television. And you have clergy who are afraid to preach the gospel. That's number one. Number two is we've forgotten all about grace. If it were not for grace, I would be in deep, deep trouble. But I realize that at the point that Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died for my sins, the sins I had committed, the sins I was committing, and the sins I will commit, as long as I understand that I have to be in prayer and I have to have faith and believe that his grace and that's 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 something we don't we don't get into the words that impact our lives and I've reached a point in my life now where I can be around somebody and Mary can tell you I can be around somebody for five minutes and I can tell whether or not they're for real, whether or not they're playing the Christian game, whether or not they're playing the religious game. Uh, we have got to be standard bearers. We have got to be people who other people see are living their lives for Christ. And you don't have to run off at the mouth. And you know, I see some people that had a lady come to my door not too long ago. And after about 15 minutes, I said, ma'am, I, I told you 20 minutes ago that my dinner was on the table. And I tried to be as considerate as I could be. But you just aren't going to stop. <laughs> and, I, and I told you who I was. And I told you what I believe. Now I'm going to ask you to leave. Sometimes you have to do that, you know? And sometimes you have to tell your friends, uh, you know, I'm sorry, but I don't participate in those kinds of jokes. I don't participate in those kinds of games. And you've got to stand to be counted and people see that just like people see here at Norfield. They want to be a part of it. They want to, you know, they, they, want, they want that feeling. Everybody wants that feeling of, of uh, uh, that, that, that the Lord is on my side. But we're, in a, we're living in dangerous, dangerous days. I've been blessed to be to speak all over the world, Middle East, Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, you name it. And it's really scary. Uh, people hate this country because they see us 
saying one thing and doing another. This latest uh, thing where we've been spying on our friends and people look at us and say, you know, I, I don't want to be like those people. But anyway, I don't want to uh, keep you up. I'm one of the people that just joined last week. Mm -hmm. I've been coming to Northfield a couple of years, and I also grew up in the Catholic Church. And um, for probably, probably seven or eight years, I've been sort of going to different churches. And um, when I came to Northfield, you know, you said it's not just in the words, it's in the actions. The two things that, and I, that, and I was really hesitant about joining the church because of that Catholic guilt from growing up. Um, the two things that really, made me um, make a decision to join Moorfield were, one, that giving fair, which showed me that people, it wasn't just about the words, you know, between Taffy and Sue and everybody involved with that, it was really just living this, this message of, of, of helping others. Um, Bernard, I mean, and, and Nareda, and just the, the welcome that, that everyone showed from the first time I stepped into this church two years ago. And then I also started going to the Bible study, and my gosh, what a world that's opened up to me to be able to be with these amazing women who've been, who again, it's not that they're, they're preaching, it's that they're living the, the embodiment of what Christ's message is. And they're okay saying, you know, I'm scared, I don't know what, so I'm learning from them because they're an example of, you know, this is, this is, Having the faith, it's having faith that we are taken care of, and and that we can be there for each other. Um, and I just think it's it's a it's a powerful thing, and I, I just feel so much a part of. And for me, I think it is the relationships that help me to feel connected, and and um, and I learn by seeing other people. So I I just wanted to put that out there. Fantastic. Again, thank you. I'd like to. I wanted to uh, uh, end with a poem that I want you to keep in your minds. Prayer is a complex phenomenon. It helps to narrow our focus in first talking about it. It is a request spoken to God. What is it? Prayer is the soul's sincere desire, unuttered or expressed, the motion of a hidden fire that trembles in the breast. Prayer is the burden of a sigh, the falling of a tear, the upward glancing of an eye when none but God is near. Prayer is the simplest form of speech that infant lips can try. Prayer the sublimest strains that reach the majesty on high. Prayer is the Christian's vital breath, the Christian's native air. His watchword at the gates of death, he enters heaven with prayer. Prayer is the contrite sinner's voice returning from his ways, while angels in their songs rejoice and cry, Behold, he prays. The saints in prayer appear as one, in word, in deed, in mind, while with the Father and the Son, sweet fellowship they find. No prayer is made by man alone, the Holy Spirit pleads and Jesus on the eternal throne for sinners intercedes. Amen.